join me today at the wheel of one of the UK's rarest cars. Yes, today I'm driving a Hillman Hunter GLS. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today we're looking at one of the rarest cars on Britain's roads. Yes, this is a Hillman Hunter, but not just any Hillman Hunter. This is a Hillman Hunter GLS with a whole bay engine. Now, as I am sure you are aware, by the middle of the 20th century, the Roots Group was one of the biggest car corporations on the planet. They had about half a dozen different brands under their umbrella. Sunbeam, Singer, Humber, even Paycan, and of course, Hillman. That of course meant there was a whole lot of badge engineering coming along, and in the early 1960s they needed something to replace the Audax range, which is their mid-sized saloons, and of course the M needed something to replace it as well. So a new range was put into production to be badge engineered across all the different umbrella brands, and that was going to be called the Arrow series. In 1962 they put pen to paper and started drawing it, and this is roughly the shape that all the cars got. The Hillman was the first one to appear in the form of the Hunter. But the GLS didn't arrive until 1973. Now there's a few ways of telling you've got yourself a GLS, notably the badge on the front that says GLS, but also the headlights. Most Hunters only came with a single headlamp, a square unit, but the GLS though got the twin lights. Of course when you look at the rest of this range you'll notice that all different cars have got slightly different versions of the headlight and grill arrangement. The Scepter is the most similar to this because it too has the twin round headlamp arrangement, plus it's got a similar shape grill to this butting chrome because Scepters were posh. Now this colour, Limelight, was unique to the GLS. It was a 72 only colour but there were a number of them that continued to be available in 1973 still wearing this colour. Now on the side of the car the sporty bits continue. Here under the arches we've got Dunn style wheels. Some cars came with row styles, these ones came with Dunn styles. Um, the only thing in common is they look cool and all 13 inch. Hidden behind here we've got drum brakes on the back and discs on the front. But round the back, in keeping with what was the fashion of the time, because it was sporty we've got the black surround around the tail lights. And amazingly these lights also found their way onto the Aston V8 Vantage and the Lotus 7. Now climbing into this car there's a couple of things to notice first of all. And number one, it's the position of the handbrake. This was a hangover from the old Audax series cars which had their handbrake here beside the driver's seat. It was very much out of fashion by the time this car was launched in the late 60s. Also it's worth noting these seats are actually out of a Humber Scepter which are virtually identical but the colour is different and matches the exterior better. Now let's look first of all at the dashboard which is really very very cool indeed. Um, around this time 1972 they went from a wooden dashboard to a plain black vinyl dashboard. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the crossover year is but this has got the, the sportier looking black vinyl one which is definitely cooler at the time. And um, One thing we have got here is these double bubble instrument dials for the speedo on the left going up to 120 and the rev counter on the right redlining around 6000 rpm which is pretty good from that 1725cc four-cylinder in front. Now we'll start looking around from right to left, keep it, keep this logical and orderly. Now first of all, these door cards, very typical 1970s vinyl, lots of interesting moulding happening, so we've got lots of visual and textural interest happening. I do quite like these very angular little door handles. We've got these hard 30 degree angles on this tapering door handle, quite fine but quite solidly cast, so we're all good there. Going down to a very similarly angular and sharp window winder and an armrest so you can be comfortable when driving. Being in the 70s we do of course have quarter lights which are, are a great accessory, it's a shame we don't have them anymore. Oops, can't open one handed though, there we go, quarter light there to fly out. Now moving back into the car, as I mentioned we've got the double bubble dashboard, quite impressively for a car from the late 60s we do have air vents, proper proper air vents that move around and you can turn off and on, that's on both sides of the dashboard and vent flow in the top which is pretty advanced stuff. Don't forget we're going up against the Cortina, uh, stuff from Vauxhall, from Morris, Austin, all the other big players so they are pushing very hard to make this car as nice and as well accessoried as they can. Here in the centre which we didn't get on the lower cars, is this gauge cluster. This is properly sporty and exciting. If you think back to sports cars, coupes of the 70s, you get the multiple gauges all around the dials, but here they've got much more minimal, much more sporty, almost Alfa Romeo-like with the, uh, the twin dials here. But here we've got water, fuel, amps, and oil. Next to the standard issue blower and lights panel, 
and it also gives us room for a radio. This looks like a DAB one that has been fitted, which is a retro style, so you barely notice it's not the original anymore, which is fantastic. And then moving down, we've got this nice wooden console which houses the gear shift. Four speed manual was the standard option. You have a option for a Laycock overdrive for a fifth gear if you want it. Also, there was the option of a three speed Borgwana Type 35 automatic gearbox if you really wanted it. I don't think you got that option of the um, auto in the GLS. Later on there's a Type 45 auto, could be spec'd, I think that's from 1975 onwards. Behind that we've got the ashtray for Sweetie Wrappers and the lighter. Now in terms of T-shelfery, we don't have any cup holders. You can maybe balance something very tiny in here, otherwise you're going to be putting small cups and cans here on the wood, but you don't want to be leaving rings on there. So if you want to be putting drinks on here, you're going to need coasters people. Take care of your timber. Now behind that we've got a cubby hole. Again, this is remarkably forward thinking for a car of this decade. Big cubby hole here in the centre for mobile phones which hadn't even been invented yet. That's amazing. Behind that we have another ashtray which looks like it's never been used. And back to the front, we've got a nice size glove box here, another air vent, and a big tray. This runs the full width of the car underneath the steering wheel, underneath the glove box, loads of space for maps and sandwiches and everything else you could possibly want. And we've even got a rear screen heater switch down here. This car was properly loaded. I do rather like the owner's edition of the Radio Mobile period virtually correct speakers. This is very cool indeed. Now glancing back at the steering wheel area, we do have a very sporty leather and, and metal three-spoke wheel. Looks very good, very periodly, period perfect. Um, only one stalk. This is our indicator stalk here on the right-hand side. Uh, lights are across down here on the left. This is sort of the era of randomly splashed controls, but this is looking a bit symmetrical and kind of cool. We've got our wiper switch down here on the left, and on the right-hand side, mirroring it, we've got the choke. Now these wipers, have got the washer button on here as well, but this is a manual pushy pumpy button rather than electric. That was an option you could have chosen, but uh, clearly the original owner of this car didn't. Now looking above us, we have got a black headlining because sporty, and in the 60s and 70s, most cars had a perforated headlining. This only extends to the sun visors in this particular case. We do have a nice big black vinyl roof and very nice round textured interior light. And a very good size rear seat. Let's have a quick look at that. Now, while we have got inertia rear seat belts in the front, which I think are aftermarket, I don't think this came with them as standard. Ah, we've got not, we do catch your toes on them. Once you've got your feet through the quite small aperture for getting your fit in, feet into the back of the car, we've got not bad leg room and knee room. This is pretty better for kids, but as an adult sitting in the back, this is actually quite comfortable. I've got fairly good headroom in here and decent elbow room as well, so I'm quite impressed at this. Now the boot is actually quite a good size. Again, it's fairly comparable to its rivals from Ford, Vauxhall, Austin and the rest. Interestingly, we've got our spare wheel hanging up here in the back, which is quite good in a way because it means you're not going to lift all your luggage out if you get a puncture when you're driving or go underneath in the rain to get it from underneath the car. But it's sitting at 45 degrees, we've got a lot of dead space taken up by, well, nothing really. So being a 60s car, the seats don't fold down and you can see the back of everything. You've got the back of the head, wheel arches, you've got the inner wings you can see, and you can see the tail lights exposed, which does make changing the bulbs and things very easy, of course. But boot space is perfectly adequate for a 60s car in this size class. Right, pulling away, the first thing you do notice is, of course, that handbrake is on the wrong side. It's very unusual getting used to that. It's like driving a, a pre-war Bentley or something. The second thing you notice is the performance. It's really lively. This little 17, 25 cc is a pokey little thing. We're hitting 40 miles an hour already. Oh, what a great car. That's a cool building as well. So when they were engineering this car, they looked initially at things like a rear engine car following the imp pattern, but discounted that. Clever aluminium engines, but following the warranty claims they'd suffered from poor maintenance of the imps, they didn't want to do that. So they used a modified five bearing version of the uh, old 1725cc. That was in the general range of the uh, Arrows cars. In this version, the GLS, things got a bit more exciting. Whole bay worked their magic on it. It's got a pair of twin Weber 40 carburettors on it 
It's got a new aluminium head, it's got a new camshaft. In competition versions, this was making 120 horsepower. But for the road going versions, that was dialed down a little. It was 104 horsepower. And maybe less, but it's still more than the 88, which the best GL got. And boy, does it feel rapid and really free revving. To pedal a short distance throw, and the um, and the gear stick itself is a long throw, but it's a very clicky, positive change. We've got our indicator on the right hand side, it's one of those lovely old tinky tinky sounds. And the car flies away again, oh it's so much fun. Not self cancelling I notice. Visibility is good all round, really high ceiling you notice, that's quite interesting. Now the other day someone asked me why I don't do full on 0 to 60 tests on cars. I'll be honest, it's not my car to thrash, so I don't want to risk damaging someone else's car. But the 0 to 60 on this thing was 10 and a half seconds. I'm only taking this about halfway around the dial to about sort of 3,000 RPM or so. Still feels pretty rapid. It feels quite grippy and controlled through the corners. The car does handle fairly flatly through the bends. It's quite hard sprung. Now this car is a couple of firsts for Roots. It was, I believe, the first Roots car to have McPherson struts in the front. It's got a live axle and leaf springs in the back. Uh, it's also the first Roots car to have uh, curved glass in the doors. As well as firsts, it's also got a, a notable last. During the car's development phase, the company was bought by Chrysler. And so this is the, one of the very last cars to wear one of the old Roots Group names that had no input from the new owners. Now this is a really interesting car because everyone remembers the Lotus Cortina. But this is virtually forgotten. The performance was on a par, and you could say this is more exclusive. It just doesn't have the cachet of the Lotus name attached to it. We do have Holbay though. And Holbay were a serious tuning company in the 1960s. Serious and well respected, I should say. The gears are nicely spaced for charging up through the revs and getting a bit of speed going. It really is an entertaining car to drive. But it's interesting though, it is interesting though, that this car doesn't have the optional overdrive as that was virtually always specced on the, well certainly on the high spec cars, it was always picked as an option. So it's quite unusual this car doesn't feature it. Although the owner does say he's looking out for one so he can retrofit one. These seats really are comfortable. You can see this being a popular car back in the 1960s and the 70s, of course. As a nice family car. Even in the most standard form, it's going to be a nice handling, comfortable four, five seater. Cram the kids in the back. No seat belts in those days, so you can squeeze them all in. It's interesting how the Roots Group made badge engineering so successful because all of their brands, although the car was the same underneath, had such different personalities. The Humber Scepter, the Hillman Hunter, totally different. And of course it was sold as a Singer or a Sunbeam in other countries as well. Even in Iran as the Paycan pickup truck, where it was made until just after the millennia. That would be a fun thing to add to your collection in this country. Apparently some Iranian parts are in this car. I think it's got an Iranian fuel tank because the parts were still available. The steering is very light and very accurate and uh, people really don't trust or like the sound of drum brakes anymore but these are really powerful. I can't do an emergency stop as there is traffic behind me but trust me the brakes are strong. The car only weighs 995 kilograms so it's not a massive amount of weight it's got to stop. 
And this is such a great fun car to drive. I do have a bit of an affection for roots cars. It's crazy I've never owned one. I hardly even have any on the channel either. So I'm glad we finally have one of these Arrows cars online. Thanks for watching today. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this astonishingly rare piece of British automobilia. I've never even seen a Hunter GLS before in the flesh, so it was a real privilege to be driving one. So big thanks to the owner for letting me take it out today. If you've enjoyed this drive out, then please do hit the like and subscribe buttons and the bell notification so you can see any videos coming out next time. And join me again next time driving something completely different.